Hello, so good morning or good uh, almost noon uh, today. Um, let me introduce you uh, the panelists we've selected for all of you. So we have Martin from Acer that has is trying to get online and he will hopefully soon join us. And then we have Helene from Euroelectric. We have Marta for NSUI and Maria for European Commission. And why are we here? Well, we've celebrated not too long ago that we've uh, come at the end of a quite long process to produce what we call the network codes. Meanwhile, we also have the winter package that is again treating also the topic of network codes. Um, the several stakeholders have come out with position papers related to the winter package and also the aspect of network codes. So I think there is more than enough for us to discuss. We only have an hour. Um, but we won't only discuss among us here, the ones you see in, with the video. We also really want to know what you think, and that will actually trigger our discussion. Uh, we've divided the discussion in three parts. First part will be on what does it mean, a network code or a guideline. Second part is the development process. And the third part is what we call the amendment uh, process. So let me kick off uh, the first. So what's in a name? What are these network codes? And here you have a list of them. And you already see that uh, they touch upon everything uh, related to market integration and, and system integration. So if you think that network codes is only about network, think again, because it's much more than that. It's really us for the first time having a very set uh, detailed set of rules to sort of formalize market integration the ongoing completion of the internal energy market is very important maybe some people have been focused a lot on the winter package and have not yet fully been up to speed with what's going on on the network codes but you should definitely catch up and the first question to all of you is do you think it actually matters that some of these network codes are called guidelines as you can see there are two groups here some of them have, still have the name network codes. Others have the name guidelines. Um, they're all part of a process that was set up by the third package, a co-creation process between NSUE, Acer, European Commission, with, of course, also stakeholders involved. But this is what came out. So what's in a name? And the first poll is uh, to, to ask you, do you have any preference you, between network code guideline? Yes, no. Um, and, and if you prefer one of the two, let us know which one. So, Chiara, you can launch the poll so everybody gives uh, their answer. And we will then also share the statistics uh, with you. So, I see many of you already voting. And now we are broadcasting the results, but you can still vote, I guess. Um, so what do we see? We see, uh, yeah, the majority, 60%, is choosing uh, for network codes. Very small group of people is indifferent. And about 25% uh, prefers guidelines. So I don't know what my panelists prefer, <laughs> but this is a good way to kickstart uh, our debate. And maybe you can also, somebody can maybe explain what's the difference <laughs> and why is it that we used to call them all network codes and now some of them became guidelines. Who would like to go first? Maria, please. I can go first because I'm afraid it was the commission's fault to make the distinction. <laughs> the guidelines on the network codes and why they all started with the network code name and they changed the guidelines. So um, first, uh, before we start with the differences, I think it's important to understand the similarities. And the similarities is that the network codes and guidelines have the same value. They are commission regulations and they are binding. Uh, they are also directly applicable and uh, they follow the same adoption procedure. They are adopted through the comitology procedure. Now, what is different? Um, they have a different legal basis in the electricity regulation. They follow also a different development uh, process and there are differences in terms of content. So essentially from the Commission side, uh, the distinction is as regards the content, not only on the topics, but on the fact that the guidelines 
clients um, can have this process whereby a set of uh, TSOs at regional level or at European level have to develop the methodologies and then this is submitted for approval to the regulators. Whereas network codes uh, don't have this uh, process set out um, in the regulation. Okay. So, who wants to go next? Yeah, anything you would like to add to the explanation of the difference by Maria? Yes, Hélène, and then Marta. Yes, no, uh, thank you, Maria, for the clarification. We, we had this absolutely the same understanding. Uh, from your electric side, um, I must say that it's not really important whether it's a network code or a guideline, but what is really important is to ensure uh, a proper stakeholder involvement. And in that sense, uh, we must say that the uh, network code, uh, if, of course, uh, the stakeholder involvement is sufficient in the drafting phase, uh, ensures a kind of um, feasibility for, for the market on where we are going to and what the, the target is, and how the market will evolve in the, the future. Um, while a guideline gives much more uh, work and much more tasks to the implementation phase, and in that sense, um, what we can say is that from the, the experience from uh, the, the different guidelines for which uh, that have already entered into force, um, sometimes we lack a bit of stakeholder involvement in the implementation phase. So mm -hmm. again, it's not really important the, whether this stakeholder involvement uh, takes place before or after. Uh, what is important for us is to have visibility on the target and stakeholder involvement in the more technical and implementation phase. Okay, thank you. Marta? Yeah, from... from ah, you muted... Um... Yeah. Yeah. So, from, from Ensoy's side, what we want to say here is that uh, we understand the main difference in the level of details, as it has been very well explained by, by Maria. We have to understand that some of the processes that are uh, in the guidelines are, let's say, uh, processes that are day-to-day -day, uh, management of the, for example, TSOs, and they are things that uh, shall change quite often. So this is why we have to develop sometimes these methodologies, and we, it makes more sense to go for a guideline. For example, if we think about uh, methodology on capacity calculation regions, we know that there will be new borders, so we will have to amend this quite often. So it makes sense that this is something included in a guideline, because if not, we will have to amend the code every time. Okay. On our side, that's the main difference between, mm -hmm. between both. We don't have so, a preference. So what I've understood for now Indeed, in the, what we call network codes or guidelines, if you read there, several times it's said, and this will be developed in a methodology. The methodology is then something that will be developed within a certain process outside of, of the codes, which has a different status. And when, it, when you have methodologies, then it's a guideline, right? It has to be a guideline. Is that correct then? Or did I not fully understand it? Maria. No, no, you fully understood, I think. Yeah, so you have this process for the development of the methodologies, and then this is submitted for approval at the NRS, but this is beyond the context of the guideline in itself. It takes place separately. So, and then so we um, really foresee, foresee, foresaw that for things that have to be amended more frequently, while then the point of your electric is you know, are we sure that within the development of the methodologies, the same stakeholder involvement is guaranteed? And, and, and how will that look like in terms of implementation? Um, maybe you could also react to that element, eh? that part of what Helene said. Marta, you would like to react to that? Yeah, yeah I, I would like to react on that. Uh, all of the methodologies, or nearly all of the methodologies, have to be publicly consulted. So there's always one month in which all the methodologies uh, has to be are public. Mm -hmm and all the stakeholders have uh, and can provide their, their feedback. After the feedback provided in these methodologies uh, has to be summarized 
and uh, has to be presented uh, to the NRAs so they can accept or not the proposed drafting of the methodology mm -hmm. by the TSOs. So the TSO should consider before uh, the proposal from the stakeholders. So also in the guidelines, this involvement of the, of the stakeholders is already uh, collected. Okay. okay. Helen, yeah, and then Maria? <laughs> So indeed, uh, we, we are uh, fully aware about the consultation process in the different methodologies. Um, our experience so far is that for some of the topics that are quite technical and quite complex, um, one month of consultation is, uh, is sometimes very short. And uh, what we think can, uh, can be improved is to have more frequent uh, technical stakeholder discussions when building the methodology. So a bit similar to what we would do when drafting the code is that uh, we would appreciate to have more in involvement at the moment where there, there is still, for instance, different alternatives on the table and not only uh, at the, the last stage when the final proposal uh, from the TSO is there. So uh, we think there that we could uh, even reinforce the, the collaboration. Just as a clarification before I give the floor to Maria, how many of the methodologies I mean, more or less, how many are foreseen to be developed and how many have already gone through the process? So how new is this process, basically, um, for the development of methodologies? Just to get an idea over, I mean, roughly. Uh, the ones that I, it comes just quickly to my mind yeah. uh, is that uh, five methodologies have been already presented by NSOE for public consultation. Mm -hmm. It could be... Uh, one or two more, but I have to, to check. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, there will be quite already some more that uh, that will will come. And on the NSUI side, the, the process is still something that is being developed or it's cast in stone, it will be like that for a while? The process that uh, that we have is that, just to also clarify what uh, Elaine was, was saying, is that we, we fully agree that uh, having uh, just one month for consultation is uh, is quite short time. Uh, the problem is that we do not have a lot of time either to develop the methodologies. Mm. So probably this is something that uh, we can fully support uh, the stakeholders in this time and uh, we would like to have also more time to consult and also to collect all of those uh, comments. Also to, to complement uh, once the public consultation takes place, this is the draft proposal. So after the, the, the stakeholders provide their feedback, we consider their feedback and we change the proposal. Uh, so we have to assess all of the comments from the stakeholders and decide if we take them or not on board and explain this to the regulators. So the version that goes to consultation is not the final version that goes to the regulators. It considers already the feedback from the stakeholders. And of course, after the regulator has to decide if how the DSO has decided to include or not the feedback from the stakeholders, is the best way or not. That's for sure part of the regulator's approval process. Okay. Thank you, Marta. Maria, you wanted to intervene also. Yeah. So on the on the development of the methodologies and the consultation to stakeholders, I know that, for example, NSOE recently has prepared informal workshops uh, kind of for consultation of the stakeholders well before ahead the development of the proposal when they're still on the thinking or phase, let's say, for the proposal for the methodology, um, and we think this helps, you know, bridge the fact that there are very short uh, time frames uh, for developing these methodologies as stakeholders, and we think this is a very positive development, even though it's not envisaged uh, formally in the in the network codes and in the guidelines. Um, and then uh, also to mention that there is another way through which um, stakeholders can participate and it's through the stakeholder committee, which is also envisaged in, uh, in each of the network codes and the guidelines. Uh, there is this obligation to create the stakeholder committees. They have been set up in the meantime. There are three, one for each big family of uh, network codes and guidelines, and that's another uh, means for... Mm -hmm. stakeholders to, to engage uh, in, in the discussions as well. Okay. 
if somebody still wants to add to something, if not, I think, uh, ah, Helen, you want to still react, yes? Yes, yeah, to, to react to that, um, we have had some very good experience for some of the methodologies, for instance, on the um, development of the standard product for the balancing, where the discussion with the uh, NSOE started some, I think, about more than one year ago. Uh, so really, uh, at the beginning of the process in, in, the, in an appropriate forum where we, we have had a lot of discussion. So that's uh, typically the, the kind of uh, involvement that we appreciate. So indeed, I, I confirm what you said, Maria. So of course, there is a constraint on the resources and the time we all have. But uh, for important topics, this is really the kind of uh, uh, constructive collaboration that we appreciate. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much. So if somebody still has a question on this topic, you can add it to the chat box. Um, I'll just give you a minute and then we move on to the next uh, topic. If there are no immediate questions for clarification. Um, anything you wanted to know on the difference between network code and guideline? Now is the moment. <laughs> if not, we've been extremely clear. <laughs> So I don't see anybody starting to type. Good, because we still have a lot to discuss. Now, on the development process itself. Uh, so we are at the end of this process. It's good to reflect on it, especially because we will probably do it again for many more codes um, that are foreseen in the winter package. If you read the introduction to the EU Clean Energy Package, it mentions there that the idea has been to simplify and streamline the procedure for the elaboration of electricity network codes. And it also includes um, the European entity for DSOs now in the process and other stakeholders more closely in the procedure. If you can go down at the actual articles, I'm not going to read out the whole article, uh, but I think this is one of the articles uh, concerned that refers to the more streamlined process, Article 55. And I think some observers have said that what is implied there is that the role of ACER has somewhat increased. Um, and so that's a question we can ask you. Um, and that brings us to the next poll. So what does the audience think about that, uh, about these proposed changes to the development process? Um, do you agree with that? Do you partly agree or you completely disagree with what is being proposed there? So the people saying disagree, they liked the process that we had, so why change it? Um, others might think that it's uh, that, it, that we have we should have changed it in another way. <laughs> or um, you, you really like this increased role um, for Acer with also the role of the DSO entity and maybe more involvement of stakeholders. So we'll launch the poll again, Chiara, if you can do that, please. And then we'll have a look at what you think. So, so most of you are partly agreeing. 85% going down a little bit. So, yeah, so the, if you count both together, about 90% uh, agrees or partly agrees. There is a minority that disagrees, a small minority. Um, okay. So, who would like to maybe clarify the changes that are being proposed? Did I describe them? Somewhat correctly, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Maria. <laughs> Again, you have the commission to blame for the new text. That, um, uh, <laughs> um, so I, I can explain a bit uh, the logic developed a number of network codes in the meantime. We have gained experience. So the idea was to take a stock of this experience, of the feedback received uh, from the different stakeholders, 
to the development process and then try to um, see how we can ameliorate that process in order to try to make sure that people support it in a way. And uh, so, so the main changes that we have introduced, but this is just like a, um, a very general overview, is to try to allow for more stakeholder involvement already in the earlier process. So, um, for example, we noticed that um, there will be topics that we are proposing for new network code development, which are more related to the distribution system. So we really wanted to make sure that actually uh, the distributors have a more active role in the development of this future network code. So that is why they have this EU VSO body will have uh, such a role. And um, also we make some adjustments indeed to ACES role as regards uh, the development of the, um, of the network codes so because before the ACES role was somewhat limited. They had to recommend its adoption, but they considered that this limited their possibility to introduce changes to the text as proposed by MSOE. So in order to try to make the process uh, um, be more efficient for all the stakeholders involved, we thought that it would be better for ASA to have a more proactive role in that. There is a new element in there, which will be the drafting committee, uh, which is set out also for the development process, for the drafting process. And those are the three main changes from my point of view. OK. So I, we were challenged in the chat box by Ralph saying, the poll is a bit weird, because maybe I agree with part of these changes, but not all of them. But we do that deliberately. Yeah? So it's also to provoke a discussion. And if you have a strong opinion about one of these changes, but not the other, please add it to the chat box. So then we can pick it up in the discussion. Um, but already, thank you, Maria, to, to, to highlight these three elements. Um, so, who would like to react to one of these three or all three? Helen? Maybe just be, before reacting to uh, ask, ask, add a question to Maria, uh, can you clarify the new drafting committee? I think that might be useful in the discussion. Mm. Um, yeah, so, well, you know that the process is that um, ASA, well, the Commission invites ASA to prepare a framework guideline, a non framework guideline, and once uh, uh, the Commission gives the green light to the framework guideline, then uh, it invites NSOE or the new EU DSO body to draft the actual network code. And in doing so, these uh, this, uh, associations uh, will have to set up a, what they call a what we call in the regulation a drastic committee, which will be comprised by ESA, NSOE, the EU DSO body, and selected the stakeholders that uh, are considered to be mostly affected by the topic of the of the network code, and um, they they will provide feedback during the drafting process. So um, that's that's a bit the idea behind. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alan, please. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. So from your electric side, um, we are quite uh, happy with the, the proposed changes uh, because it uh, puts more emphasis to the, the stakeholder involvement in the drafting process. That's why I just asked you to, to clarify it. Um, mm -hmm. But we still would appreciate some clarification or strengthening of on these uh, involved stakeholders uh, to make sure uh, we, we know who is, uh, who is the uh, affected stakeholder, as you mentioned. So we think it's good because mm -hmm. from the drafting of existing codes, uh, we have always expressed some, uh, some concern on the, the weight or the, the, yeah, the, the power that was given to uh, NSOE in the drafting process. And as we said uh, in the previous question, uh, whether it's a network code or a guideline, uh, both have uh, advantage and uh, disadvantages, um, but what is really important is the stakeholder involvement. So we think that the proposed change go in the, the right direction. Okay. And uh, what about the other elements? So you reacted to one element, this drafting committee. What about the DSO entity and uh, the role of ACER? Uh, your electric also supports the, the creation of this uh, DSO body and as well as the, the, the role of ACER there. So we are okay. globally, uh, at least at the moment, we are globally uh, satisfied. Okay. Marta? Yeah. From, from NSOE side, what uh, I think it's, it's important for us is first, uh, we very much welcome uh, to have a stronger ACER in the, in the process. 
we have a lot of experience working with the NRAs and sometimes uh, having a, all NRAs approval is, is very difficult. So having a stronger ACER I think uh, is very good for, for this coordination. But the important thing here, and I think is what is not yet developed, is how uh, ACER is going to have the tools and the resources to really be able to coordinate all of the NRAs. So I think this is a point that uh, should be worked uh, further. Mm. Regarding the second point, regarding the, the drafting uh, committee, here what we would like to say is that NSOE has uh, already gained a lot of experience. We have put a lot of effort in this uh, drafting and it has been a very, very, very difficult task for that we have uh, accomplished here. Uh, so in a way, what we feel here is that all of the success, because now we have network codes that uh, mm. Uh, it has not been uh, completely uh, collected in, in this uh, new regulation. On the other side, we very much welcome the involvement of the stakeholders, uh, but regarding this committee, we do not see how it will work in practice. Because on one side, we are proposing to have a committee that uh, will be shared by NSOE, but uh, how it will be uh, the regional representation, because we know also for experience that sometimes it's easier to have uh, an agreement, for example, from the NRA, uh, TSO and the stakeholders of one region, that's easier than to have an agreement of all TSOs or all NRAs. So with this uh, new way of, of creating this uh, mm, committees in practice, uh, we do not see very clear how we will be able to, to propose something. And also for the decision making, it's not, uh, it's not fully clear. Uh, regarding the third point, the DSO's involvement, of course we welcome that uh, the DSO's will create a body and will be more involvement. If from our side here, our, our point is that the system is one. We don't want to make silos between the different voltage levels. So we, we need to, to keep coherence and, and keep uh, every time the TSOs involved in the, in, the, in the whole process, especially because we are the technical experts and, and we need to, to have the picture of everything that is uh, developed here. Okay. So I think Ralph agrees with you, uh, Marta, because he, he also wrote, uh, meanwhile, that he has experience with the drafting and he disagrees with the new adoption uh, procedure. And so he's also a bit worried. Maria, why are you not so worried? <laughs> well, it depends because, I mean, the drafting committee is part of the development of the network codes. By adoption procedure, I'm not sure whether they mean the adoption procedure, the change from implementing act into delegated act, uh, which is the adoption procedure for the network code. So it would be great if uh, Ralph can clarify that. Um, of course, the, the text on the, on the drafting committees is quite uh, open because at, at the end of the day, this is an EU regulation and uh, it provides for a certain degree of flexibility on how these committees can be set out and, uh, you know, um, the, the nature of the role and the degree of the participation in the development process. Uh, we can think of ways of strengthening the drafting committee and uh, providing more clarity in the text, but now this is on the table precisely for discussion in the negotiations between the Council and the Parliament as part of the legislative process. So we will, we will see uh, how the, then this can be ameliorated. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear that in general at least the idea of having a drafting committee that has fulfilled such a role uh, is widely supported. Okay. So, Marta, you want to react and then help? Yeah. yeah, but very shortly. Uh, also, uh, a reaction to, to Maria's comment is that with experience that we have in SOE drafting, that as I said, we really put a lot of efforts in, mm -hmm. in this. The decision making uh, is very important. And now it's not clear uh, which draft will go, for example, to Acer or which draft. Uh, how, we, how this decision making of, mm -hmm. of the draft of each word, because I don't know if you have ever been in a, in a drafting committee, but you go word by word, and uh, everybody has something to say. There's a lot of regional interest. Mm -hmm. That's why it's not only something regarding all TSOs or all NRAs or all stakeholders. It's m sometimes it's very much regarding one region. So this is something that uh, should be worked further. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Helen, you wanted to react also? Uh, so on the adoption process, so the move from uh, implementing to delegated acts, um, our experience from the current codes on the, the committology process is that it was quite long and uh, and uh, not transparent for, for stakeholders. So of course, we on our side, we don't have visibility on uh, what is being discussed there. And we have the perception that it um, slowed down the, the whole process, that it was quite uh, long. So the willingness to simplify and to make sure that we are a bit more agile and, uh, and quick in adopting code is, is welcome. Uh, of course, then it's, it, we need to make sure that the drafting uh, committee is, uh, works, pro uh, works properly with the, the necessary uh, stakeholder involvement and, uh, and that at the end of this drafting committee, uh, all the stakeholders are quite comfortable with the, the version because, of course, that would mean that after that, the, the step to, to adopt the code is, is quicker and uh, probably more. Uh, so do I understand correctly that we are going from a previous procedure in which the drafting, there was more a clear one entity responsibility to then a comitology procedure that was more open, that we're trying to make it more open from the beginning, hoping that then the, uh, you know, the adoption will go quicker and smoother. Is, is that a summary or... Or do you think that the comitology process will still be the same? You're just anyway trying to make it more open from the beginning. So um, on the development phase, the idea is to make it more open from the beginning and to have more stakeholder involvement as we got to development following some criticism about the lack of uh, you know, active involvement in the, in the process. Um, but then uh, the comitology procedure, meaning the procedure for the adoption, so once the development has taken place, that's going to change on the basis of the current proposals because we're moving from a framework of implementing act where we have this uh, comitology process with the member state uh, committee, which is the one who gives a bit the green light in order for them to proceed to the scrutiny by the council and the parliament and final to the adoption to the a framework of delegated acts where actually um, there isn't such a formal role for a member state committee. What there will be is a kind of an expert uh, committee formed by member states, but uh, they don't have the competence or they don't have the powers to give the green light as such in this committee um, to go ahead with the network odds. It's the commission who decides to adopt it, but then it will go to the scrutiny of the council and the parliament who can then veto it. So it will change a bit the, the, the adoption process, let's say, of, of the network odds. So. But the idea is that overall it will be more inclusive, not necessarily faster, or the, 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 the idea is also to make it faster? Or, I mean, what's the hope, the hoped outcome? I think uh, it's more inclusive, not necessarily faster. Okay. I think that would be the idea. Okay. So, Marta, in case you are right and it will become much more difficult, you won't be blamed if it's not faster. <laughs> is this, you know, making you feel a bit better? <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 it's really difficult for us to, to imagine how these drafting committees are going to, to look like mm -hmm. uh, with all of the interest. And I say that sometimes it's not only horizontal interest, but regional interest. And uh, But, well, we of course, we will do our best. And with all of the experience that we have already, we hope to, to be mm -hmm. able to make it also. <laughs> okay. Um, let me pick up before we... Uh, Helen, you wanted to intervene once more? No, eh? so I can pick up maybe something uh, from the chat box because people are getting active, which is good. <laughs> um, so you have Mikhail saying, um, I do not think that moving to delegated acts will simplify or speed up. Yeah, okay, but I think meanwhile Maria sort of already said that she agrees with that. No, so it's not necessary. So or, or that part might speed up, but it's maybe the first part that will not necessarily speed up. Mm -hmm. um, just to perhaps add that the change from implemented 
implementing to delegated act actually comes from the Treaty of Lisbon and as such we feel that uh, after the adoption of the Treaty of Lisbon um, the kind of acts that network codes and guidelines constitute should fall under the box of delegated act and not implementing act. We are hearing some criticism from stakeholders, from member states, from NRAs who are worried about this change um, and again this will be being discussed uh, but, but that was why the change uh, took place in the, in the regulation. Okay. Timothy is making a strong point that uh, the consultation process should be improved, but that I think is what he's trying to be, you know, that's the philosophy, I guess, of the changes in the, in the winter package. Mm -hmm. We have Eva saying practical involvement of smaller DSO is a matter of an intelligent design of the organization of the entity. I um, don't know if one of you wants to pick up that point, because um, that's still pending, right? How that entity will look like and, and um, how DSOs will be represented in that entity. Maybe you could say a few words on that. And then the last point is directed to you, Maria. Is it correct that Council and par Parliament can only veto the resulting code as a whole? Uh, so not specific parts. Um, so, yeah, Maria, I, I feel that maybe you could start. So, should I start? Or? <laughs> yeah, well, at least one is directed. Um, so, on the on the EU, <laughs> on the on the EU DSO entity, I'm afraid I I don't know the details because I'm not involved in that part of the discussions in the context of the clean energy package. Uh, so, I don't I don't really know uh, the details of what is behind the proposals and how they will. Uh, um, deal with the uh, participation of DSOs, the smaller DSOs, versus the bigger DSOs. Um, on, the, on the other question, which is on the vetoing, I, I believe that's correct, yes, that they can only veto the code as a whole and not parts of it. Um, yeah. okay. I, I think that's the case. Uh, okay. Um, Helen, yes? You can intervene. Yes, th there was a question addressed to me from a uh, there was a question addressed to me from Nicolo asking uh, why not to involve traders and consumers in the, I guess, in the drafting uh, process. Uh, I think this question is uh, precisely related to the concern we expressed in the beginning that we would appreciate some clarification on uh, the, the text that is currently saying uh, uh, relevant stakeholders, or I, I don't remember, yeah, limited number of affected stakeholders. So mm -hmm. I think the question is uh, who these affected stakeholders are, and of course uh, um, I think uh, trader association and consumer association are affected stakeholders, so they should somehow be involved as well. But that's mm -hmm. my point of view, of course. <laughs> okay. okay. Normally here would have been good to also have Martin from uh, on behalf of Acer to say that uh, I guess they welcome their increased role <laughs> and, and I'm sure they agree with Marta's comment that they will need the necessary resources to do it properly um, and, and maybe we can also share with everybody um, that there is a, a detailed uh, position paper of also of Acer where you can also read uh, their reaction to this part of the winter package. Um, so, okay, we, we still have 15 minutes, so I propose we, we move to the last part. And in the last part, um, I wanted to start with a show of hands. So, um, this allows me to explain you one of the icons in your top bar. There is a little man there with his hand like this, and you can select if you agree or disagree. And then uh, next to your name, we will see green or red, um, just to get um, an idea of what you think. So how many of you think that we will need to start amending the codes that have just been finished <laughs> very soon? Or is it something we can wait? So maybe some of you think, let's implement it first in the coming years, or do we already need amendments? If you think we need amendments, please take the, the, the green button. If you don't think we need amendments anytime soon, uh, please take the red button. So I see some green buttons appearing, some red also. Yes, we should also. Uh, 
So maybe one of my colleagues can try to summarize because we should be able to see a summary of the... So, okay, thank you. My colleagues did, well, so... Well, <laughs> well, that's in disagree, and 13 so far disagree. Okay, and good. And you so, find the results in the chat. So not everybody's convinced we will be doing um, amendments anytime soon. But if we will do, what do you think about what the EU uh, Clean Energy Package proposes regarding these amendments? Because here you have um, this uh, new article, Article 56. It talks about the fact that we might have amendments and that can be proposed by the agency under the procedure set out in paragraph 2 to 4 of this article. And again, I'm not going to take you through the whole article, but this is the article concerned. And what, what I understood is that it's uh, not necessarily introducing a shortcut to get amendments quicker. It's rather saying uh, these are the responsibilities of the different actors to collect the need for amendments. Mm -hmm. And if there will be amendments, they will then go through the same process as the development process. Right? I see Maria nodding, so my summary is at least high level correct. So, no. <laughs> I, can, I can add a bit of more color to, to okay. your summary. Uh, so, um, the Commission always has the power or the competence to introduce amendments to the network code, so following the process. Uh, what the text uh, on, well, the text uh, in Article 56 now clarifies that. It also clarifies how the process works when the amendments are submitted to the stakeholders, because yeah. uh, before, in the way the text was drafted, it meant that every time stakeholders made proposals for amendments, uh, ASA should consult then. Mm -hmm. Uh, carry out a public consultation and then um, to, to table these amendments to the Commission to consider. Okay. For, for, for amending the network codes and uh, administering that these amendments uh, should be. Uh, Further um, um, assessed and uh, mm -hmm. carries out a public consultation, and only on that basis, uh, progress, no. but otherwise, the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the connection with, um, yeah, okay. So before I give the floor to Helen and, and Marta to react and to give um, their view on this proposed article, let me just quickly launch the poll again, uh, the last poll of, of this event, to know what people think. So um, who agrees with this proposed amendment process, or partly agrees or disagrees? And again, if you want to make more specific comments, feel free to add them to the chat box, like Ralph has already done, and many others too. So Ralph is already saying amendments, yes, but the implementation first, not to confuse the two processes. Um, so most seem to be positive, eh? so... I don't see anybody really disagreeing with this uh, this article. Um, okay. So yeah. So let's start the discussion. Um, I, I don't remember who was first, Helen or Marta, to to react. Uh, <laughs> Helen, Ale. <laughs> Okay. Um, as such, on the article, we don't have uh, any any strong issue. Um, we share the concern that implementation is is very important, and uh, uh, actually, mm -hmm. the experience we see that it's actually much more difficult and uh, and uh, yeah, difficult than than the drafting. Or that's at least what what we see from our side. Of course, we were not the one drafting. Um, <laughs> so we think it's important to to make sure that uh, that efforts are made 
made at a regional and national level for the implementation. Uh, but of course, if there is a need for amendments, I think it's important that there is a process in place that is a, a correct process and allowing to be, again, to be agile and to do it the best way. But the concern we have is whether um, on, OK, what will be necessary in terms of amendments? And I don't want to jump on, on another topic, but our, our concern is rather on the areas for new codes, uh, where we think that uh, for the majority of these areas, uh, we see an overlap with existing codes, and therefore we think that it would be better to treat these topics if there is any need for, for modification uh, via amendments of existing codes rather than uh, creating a new code. Uh, for instance, uh, flexibility. Uh, we think that there is the CSAM, the balancing in place. Should there be any issue in the way they are uh, structured that prevents something to uh, that prevents flexibility to be uh, to be correctly uh, valorized or uh, offered or whatever, uh, then we of course support an amendment. But we are afraid of overlaps, so that's why we are quite happy to see a concrete proposal for amendments, but concern on the areas for new codes. Yeah. And, and that's actually also what Eric in the chat box is suggesting. Huh? Uh, so which topics may trigger amendments? And the topics he's mentioning there are some of the topics that are mentioned under the list of potential new codes. Um, so is that something both Marta and Maria agree? That what is what are called potentially new codes in the Winter package could actually become amendments of existing codes? Or what's your view on that? Um. Well, yeah, I, I, I think the, the thinking as regards uh, what shape uh, would take, you know, introducing these new topics um, as part of amendments of network codes or new network codes hasn't been done yet uh, in, inside um, the, the commission, or at least that's, that's my view. That will need to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and see how potentially this big change uh, could be. I think it was more the idea to a matter of adding new areas where we think that the uh, there could be a need in the future for, for, for addressing them. And also, on other instances, it was also about clarifying the legal basis, because uh, as it was initially the list in the third package, this list was very general, and uh, so th that could raise doubts as to whether certain topics could be addressed under those general lines or not. So at least now it will be clear that there is a legal basis to address those topics in the shape of network code. So that was the, the thinking. OK, so it's still open. New areas does not necessarily mean new codes for the Commission, but it's open. Marta, what's the view yeah. of SOE on this? Yeah, yeah I, I... Uh, you're muted, muted. Uh, uh. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we fully agree that first we need to implement uh, before we start thinking about the amendment. And also going back to the first question uh, that we have put in this pool, this is why it's very important that uh, we have some guidelines in which we are not defining the whole details and we propose in methodologies. That's mm -hmm. why we, it's, it's much more easier to amend a methodology than to amend the, the network code. So this mm -hmm. is just going back to the first question that we did, and this is why it's so important to sometimes leave some space to develop the methodologies and after be able to do amendments. Mm -hmm. Uh, after regarding the amendment process, uh, once again, uh, the role of ENSOE is not uh, completely clear here. We want to one more stress that uh, we have, uh, we are experts, we are the technical experts that uh, try to, to make all of the grid works. So this is why we think that we also need to be uh, we have a, a permanent role in the in the amendment process because this is very much related to our day a day work to maintain the yeah, the European electricity market going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, thanks for connecting the end of the event with the beginning. It's a very nice uh, circle in a way <laughs> that it's true that this difference between network codes and, and guidelines with the crucial element was methodologies and those can be amended uh, more easily. Um, maybe can you clarify, all, uh, I don't know who, uh, what is the amendment process for a methodology? Is it the same as the development process of a methodology or can it be different? Um, please go ahead. Please, please. please. 
Um, it's uh, quite similar to the development of a methodology. The development process of a methodology is set out in the guidelines themselves, and usually uh, it can be proposed by the TSOs and then is subject also to approval by the NRA. So it follows quite a similar process. I don't know, Marta, if maybe you want to give a bit more detail on, on that. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's the answer. So, yes, it's much more easier to, to amend than to uh, amend a network code. Okay, so this then you answers... Hmm? Yeah, just to, we will have a public consultation, we will have to amend it, hmm. it will go to the NRAs after they will have an all NRA approval, but yeah, it's hmm. not the same as, as the whole approval hmm. of the network. So, this then, yeah, please, Helen. I just want to react on uh, whether it's, it's really much easier than amending the code. Of course, we don't have experience yet uh, with amending the code, but we have to keep in mind that it's an all NRA approval, which means that uh, I'm just challenging a bit the fact that it's uh, easy. Uh, we need to pay attention to that. Mm. That's yeah. why we very much welcome Acer and a stronger Acer also to coordinate all NRA approval with tools, resources, and, and everything. Yeah. So can, can, can you maybe clarify what is then exactly in the EU Clean Energy Package that gives a stronger role to Acer for the development of methodologies? Is that foreseen? Or only more resources to... Or is it also procedural? Um. So, on the development of the methodologies and ACES role, what, what would change, um, and this is set out in the recast ACE regulation, is the fact that uh, we propose to move for, from a formula where unanimity between all NRAs is required to a formula where this is brought to the BOR, to ASA for approval, which means that then uh, the majority, um, the qualified majority or the simple majority as we propose actually uh, will apply. So in theory that should make it easier for the NRAs to come to a common solution. But um, yeah, this this is what we propose in the in the package, but uh, let's see if, if, if that will uh, be maintained or not as part of the negotiations, of course. Okay. I've learned really a lot, <laughs> including the fact that the difference between a delegated act and what was it again? I wrote it down, an implementation act and coming from the Lisbon Treaty. <laughs> As you can see, I'm not a lawyer. So this <laughs> part for me was, was uh, and these kind of elements are very new to me. Um, we still have two minutes, so unless we already have a question, we can pick up. Uh, we have a few, I see. Um, so how do TSOs and RAs vote when approving? Consensus over majority vote. So I think we just um, answered that, no, but we didn't answer the NCOE part, the TSO part. Um, um, muted, Marta. You. Nearly all of the methodologies that uh, has to be approved is the qualified majority voting for, for the TSOs at regional level and at, at European level. There are some methodologies that are uh, all TSOs, but really, really very few. Okay. So nearly all majority vote. So basically the package is proposing to, that the NRA decision is similar to how the TSO decision is for most uh, methodologies. Okay. Thank you. Um, then for methodologies, is it also that that's uh, Aya, you already answered, Helen. I didn't see that. <laughs> Thank you. And then the last one, Eric. So hopefully codes amendments will mean standardizing certain uh, concepts, not just uh, methods. Um, yes, uh, I, I, I guess we all hope that. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I think we're at the end, eh? unless we have some last minute question. <laughs> um, as you can see, our colleagues are already submitting some links because we will also have a recorded version uh, available for people that didn't, didn't make it to the live session. Um, I, yeah, I, I almost forgot. I have two more um, final messages. So if you didn't have enough today, uh, know that NCOE is organizing another webinar uh, already uh, next week. Uh, no, the week after, the 3rd of July on the value of network codes and how to measure the value. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. 
And uh, also at Florence School, in collaboration with uh, Acer, European Commission and NCOE, we have created this uh, platform for network codes. There you won't learn about the process. Uh, you will learn about what's actually in there in all these codes and what's the relevance of it and, and why is it so important. Um, and the idea of this training is really to provide an opportunity for people that have not been so much involved as my panelists to get up to speed uh, with the network codes and then maybe also start to propose some amendments or start to challenge uh, the process in the new drafting committee. Um, so I hope to see some of you back in this uh, training. And I would really like to thank my panelists again for being so open in the discussion. And uh, maybe we should do this again. Huh? <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>